Ross Ashley, a uh, former um, official with the Department of Homeland Security and entrepreneur. I'm, I'm Jane Grosso. Um, I retired from the Air Force as a Lieutenant General. I was there basically a Chief Human Capital Officer about a year ago. Yeah, I'm Juan Cole, and I'm technically challenged because I can't figure oh, this yeah. out. <laughs> 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 you don't need that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so my name is Juan Cole. I'm a back I am Vice President of Trump for Strategy and Delivery of Our Solutions. Good afternoon. My name is Joyce Hunter, and I'm the CEO of Vulcan Enterprises, Live Long and Prosper. <laughs> and I am a former Deputy CIO and Acting CIO of the Department of Agriculture. And, uh, um, I now am the CEO of a tech startup here in Tyson's called Corsha. So, so I'm going to kick this off with just letting you guys know this panel, test them, ask them questions, um, because they have a real um, deep knowledge. So we're, we're really going to have a discussion today about where where IoT and and five, some like five G when we do the fireside chat with Doug Jones, but where IoT is today and what problems it's causing in security and in actually corporations are you know. What are they doing about it, and how is it working? And I'm going to try to pepper them with questions, but I also like like you two. And so they all have insights. So I'm going to let them give sort of a, a controversial, you know, kickoff to it and sort of start. And then I'll we'll pepper them with questions. Sure. Um, so I'm looking at my badge here. It says it's a defense in depth 5G, right? So we're dealing with 5G and things of that nature. And a lot of people say going from going to 5G, like we went from 3G to 4G, what's the big deal? Well, it, it is a big deal. Um, uh, what it's going to do to for the ability for unmanned airborne vehicles to operate in our environments, uh, it has a huge amount to do with identity and who we are. Uh, who knows the comedian John Mulaney? You know John Mulaney? I'll steal from John Mulaney here for a second. How much time do we spend today proving that we're not a robot? To a robot, right? We, we do that a lot today, right? And that's not going to work moving forward as we continue to go faster and faster in five G. Um, identity is going to be critical for IoT for anything operating in five G. Do we honestly believe that we are interacting with a bot, um, a chat bot, or something of that nature that is accurately representing who we believe that we are talking with, right? Uh, I think that is going to be one of the biggest challenges moving forward. Um, when, and I'm not talking about the, the stuff on the media as far as disinformation and everything else. I'm talking about everyday commerce. I want to talk to Sears and Roebuck Company. And am I talking to an authorized representative from Sears and Roebuck that is not an actual carbon based individual? So. Yeah, I mean, from, a, from an Equifax perspective, right, having authority and data that uh, allows us to resolve to unique identities based on the information that we have sort of helps, you know, facilitate the processes that are going to be necessary to make sure that we're not talking to bots. Um, so from, a, from, from our standpoint, right, what we need to make sure is that we have the ability to leverage that data in a way that, that's consistent um, and, and that addresses some of the challenges that we just presented. We're talking to the chip bots, right? I, I mean, bots are something we're buying. Am I talking to the actual data? Yeah. Exactly. So, how does data, what does the data you have, help with that? So, I mean, I, again, you know, I think most people recognize that fact as being, uh, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the credit bureau, but in addition to the, the credit bureau data that we have, which we, you know, capture on a daily basis, uh, multiplies day, we also have data that comes from uh, utilities and exchange uh, organizations. We have data that comes from employers. So, our ability to use what is really considered to be authoritative to data provided by uh, the creators of that information, um, that allows us to, to take and resolve to a unique identity. And when we resolve to a unique identity, then we can leverage um, you know, multi factor authentication uh, and, and other forms of technology to basically provide that call center representative as an example. The ability to ask a question about the individual that's on the other uh, other end of the, of the line, 
and then be able to say, okay, this individual is truly who they say they are. I can send them there because I have the data. I can send them a unique code and make sure that the individual has the device that they claim that you know they own. And then in fact, they can provide that code back, even in a call center. I think we think about that a lot uh, online, but from a call center perspective. Uh, and, and so that prevents the ability for uh, you know somebody who's unauthorized or bought or you know, trying to replicate a, a, an individual's transactions through either the internet or in real time. And when we actually look at it, we have to also consider all of those other things, all these multi uh, acronyms, AI, VR, AR. So what does that have to do with cybersecurity and how do we secure those avenues that we're going to be able to use to be able to speed up common common tasks that everybody looks at doing? For example, at the Department of Agriculture, how do you make sure that the farmer's information is secure from the time that they fill out the application all the way through the time that a farm services agency approves it. When somebody fills out an application if they are, if they've had damage to their farm. So that's RNA. And and so how do you know that they are who they say they are? Typically in the past, we have asked the, the farmers to come into the county office. Well, you know, that kind of tends to be, uh, you know, egregious sometimes because it is three hours sometimes in, three hours back out, and that definitely uh, affects what they do on their farm. So, in our infinite wisdom in IT, we said, okay, we're going to make this tool that allows the farmer to stay at home and be able to do it from their kitchen table. Well, in our infinite wisdom as IT, we have all these... Sorry, I'm turn that off. Um, we have to um, we have to really kind of look at uh, what is going to be affected that way. Do we know who they say they are? And if they do drive the three hours, then are they going to get what they need when they get to the county office? And how on earth do you uh, get them the 5G that's necessary from rural areas? That is a big hassle right now, is to get that connectivity. And then when you do get that connectivity, how do you make sure they are who they say they are from their kitchen table in, in Missouri or Idaho? Well, um, just to throw a little bit more mud at the wall in terms of throwing out controversial ideas. Um, um, Securing the identity of individuals is really important. There are a lot of us that log into the internet, but by some statistics, for every one person, one human, that needs its identity electronically verified or in, in, a, in a, a cyber world, there might be 20 to 30 to 40 machine connections that are working around you. And so in the cybersecurity world, and particularly with the rollout of 5G, that will um, expand the role of uh, you know, networking and edge networking. Machine to machine identity, it, it, it doesn't build on the joke. It's not a human talking to a robot to prove they're not a robot. It's one robot talking to another robot to prove that it's the right robot. And there's really been very little emphasis placed on that part of the cybersecurity problem. Gartner says that by next year, um, machine-related attacks will actually eclipse human-related attacks in terms of cyber vectors. So it's an issue that has to be resolved in the 5G world. Uh, the other uh, mantra I think when I was working espionage cases and, and human cases, um, it became apparent to me that people are terrible at security. They're terrible. Uh, there's no way to fix humans. They're dumb. They're going to make mistakes. And so in some ways you have to build technology around the fallible human in the cybersecurity world. Well, um, along those lines, um, owning all of the um, HR data for the Air Force, um, what we found was that um, you have all of this protected information, and no matter how much we train people that have access to it, which was very controlled, um, it continued to get compromised. And so, to your point, um, the human, it wasn't intentional. A lot of times these folks didn't realize that, like, even in a spreadsheet, there was more than one. 
So we had to use technology to make it impossible um, to not be able to send. Um, so the, the technology screened the file and you couldn't send it. Um, and then you also need a, a clear set of rules on what you can and can't send. Um, so I think that the potential though for the big data is from the readiness perspective in the military. Um, and that, that 5G will enable so that if you really want to know how you're ready, you've got to connect people data to logistics data to health data. Um, and we've never been able to do that. And so I think that's a real potential um, huge win for the United States military. And it's, it's, it's never the technology, is it? I mean, if the technology works for the right situation, for the right incidents, it's the people. That's, that's what the, the challenge is. No matter how many tests that we have given people, we tell them don't click on you know, an anonymous email that comes through. But they don't read the entire message or they don't right click to see exactly what the address is for that individual. And they say, you know, that the, the subject line is payroll or something that would actually get somebody's attention. And off they go and they click the link, and next thing you know, there's some kind of a virus on the inside of the organization. So it's cultural, it's not technology. So, with those things all said, so if, if the human is the weakest link, how do we strengthen that link? How do we? Uh, really get people to understand that, yeah, there's going to be bots and robots and, you know, so many sensors out there with autonomous vehicles and, um, you know, ways to um, reach their destiny in the quickest amount of time using the, the easiest path, but the easiest path is, you know, souped up technology. And, and what do we do, like, do, what do we do as a, as a government, as corporations, as individuals, is there a way to create more awareness and cyber hygiene? Um, is there a way to educate more people? I mean, yeah, they're gonna, it's like kids at a candy store, they're gonna click on that box because it looks really exciting. So how do we prevent, do, do the prevention piece a little bit better? And, um, you know, we had some controversy on the panel, and I'd like to hear that, your opinions when we had to call. Um, and um, because, it was really, and not we all all agree on what the answer is. Because I don't think anybody, anybody really knows truly how we're going to solve this problem. But we do know that it's going to get ahead of us before we solve the problem. So we have to do as much as we can to be proactive. So I'd like to hear some of your use cases and best practices and what you're seeing. And please feel free anybody to jump in. So, I mean, from our perspective, again, because of the data that we have, right, we, we look at things very much from the point of view of trying to identify, proactively identify um, whether somebody's at risk, right? And we know that we're only a small part of the overall solution, so we're not intending to, to say that we can solve every aspect of it. But, you know, for years, we've been predicting um, whether somebody is going to charge off financially, right? They're going to, they just, they're, they're trending towards the fact that they're going to just charge off because they can't afford uh, you know, the, the, the debt that they've, they've established. So um, by leveraging some of that same sort of uh, technology and same capabilities and the same data, we're able to be more predictive about the type of individual that may become an insider. And that's more important than doing some of what I think we've been doing for years and years, which is, and you know, quite candidly, very lucrative for Equifax, but not necessarily the right solution, which is pull a credit report for everybody that's in the organization and then look at it in one, you know, one day and say, you know, this person looks like they're 60 days past due, they might actually be a threat. That doesn't solve the problem because you're not looking at when you're pulling that report, it's only once a year, potentially maybe twice. It's not aligned with the trend for that individual. I mean, there's a number of individuals in this, in this country that will spend a lot of money in you know, December. They will not pay their bills. They'll be 30 days past due, maybe 60 days past due, and then they'll get a bonus and then they'll pay off their bills, right? And that's because that's what happens during the holiday season. If, if you pull a report for everybody during that time, you think that everybody's 60 days past due is an insider threat or is, is a risk, you're not looking at the trend for that individual over the last 24 months. So that's just one piece, and we have to be more predictive about the individuals rather than assuming that we can look at it after the fact, right? Like they just downloaded massive amounts, which, you know, I'm just going to cause that. People are going to see a lot more data go out of an organization. Um, intellectual properties and uh, start moving much faster. We have devices that people are bringing in, whether it's a Coke machine or you know anything, and they're attached to the internet so that they can get updates. Well, who knows what's attached to those machines? And are we looking at that as being an insider uh, activity 
from a plot perspective. So our data can help identify from a financial perspective, be predictive. Uh, however, I think you know the controversy was you know you do a lot of training for employees. I think you have to train employees, but don't count on that because at the end of the day, um, you know they can't keep up with how fast the the, the threats that, and, and and you know the, the individuals who are, who are creating these threats are coming up with new and, and, and creative ways of, of targeting our our networks. And so um, I, I think we have to have a multi pronged approach and. And to me, technology is what's going to help um, identify people in a predictive manner. And how far do we go with human centric cybersecurity or behavioral analytics? You know, just going back to exactly what you said, uh, there are, you know, watching trends over a period of time, we can hopefully see, uh, you know, that there is something going on and then you can be, uh, have some mitigating factors in order to take care of it. But, you know, how far do you go? Um, you know, how far is crime? How far do you really get into a minority report kind of scenario of when people and start doing those kinds of futuristic kinds of predictions? So that, that's a big, real question. And I have, you know, I took my family to Disney last Christmas. And uh, how many of you have been to Disney? Okay. So if, if you notice, if you go in, you notice that there's a... Um, uh, they're taking a picture of you, okay? As you're walking through the turnstiles and going into Disney, there's this big wall of, of, of a video of everybody that comes through that gate. Then think about that, did you? I did. I said, oh my. You know, they're taking a picture of everybody that comes through the gate. Facial recognition? Don't know. Yeah, and so uh, we were uh, talking to a major financial institution uh, here in the United States, and they were talking about behavioral biometrics and how to uh, digitally identify people. And they said that uh, if you open their mobile banking app, they will know it's you before you type in your username because of how you act on that device. And they said things as as unique as how you walk, the gyroscope in your phone, the uh, the gait of your arm, they will know it's you. And I think that there's a policy discussion to be had about intrusion. I do think that there, as Equifax is doing, there is a role to some predictive analysis. And ultimately, I think all of us would say there is no silver bullet in cybersecurity. If there was one, we would have found it by now. And offense will always move faster than defense. So it's got to be a def defense in depth of some sort. And there, there, there is a place for training humans. I, I will say that there was a study done by a university that, that we looked at uh, that said that even among individuals who have been trained on cybersecurity hygiene and they know they're at risk, 96% of them will still opt not to engage in security practices. So we can't stop training, we can't rely on it. Um, I would say too that um, identity is a slippery thing and the more we focus on behavior and analytics about identity, the more and the more successful we are, the hackers and the attackers and the state sponsor actors will simply move to the success points and try to defeat them. So it's a it's a arms race a bit. Um, again, this defensive depth, I think, is the way to go. I would just share as a small thing that um, when Secretary Mattis became the Secretary of Defense, um, he immediately realized that everybody's cell phone going around the Pentagon, about 29,000 people depending on the day, was a real threat, and not because any of us wanted to be a threat. Um, and so it took several months, but um, so now you just come, um, you can take a cell phone in, but depending on where your office is, or you'll see all of these um, loggers outside the office. So, um, of course, I would never intentionally do that, um, but now you just keep your cell phone in that locker. And actually, I got to the point where I didn't even bring it into the building. Um, and so, again, that's something that um, it's just one more layer of depth to your point. Um, and I would agree, there's training as well. Because people like me, I'm not a technologist. Um, and so that training, I mean, it did certainly open my eyes up. It still has to change behavior. Um, but I do agree with that. Also, the training is an important piece, but not the whole. 
So, yes, the human factor is probably the hardest factor to deal with. Um, the challenge is not so much, and, and the cybersecurity factor can't be allowed to stifle innovation, right? So, as young companies and entrepreneurship and everything else, you want your developers out there pushing the edge of the envelope. You want this happening every day. Uh, and a lot of these folks are, as, as mentioned earlier, are not going to be following good cyber hygiene. So how do we, as corporate leaders, deal with that? And I think some companies are starting to come around and creating white space out there for people to behave however they want to in a creative environment. And as long as they're in that environment, they can behave in whatever way they do. And then when they come back over to the other side, they have to go back into a different, you know, kind of a more rigid, regimented way of behaving. But we can't let the whole cyber notion stop innovation. Because it will wrap, I mean, if we do, if we lock everything down, we will not get anything accomplished. Right? So there's that aspect of it. The other part of it is we spend so much of our time looking inside, right? I got asked at the last company I worked for, I was the chief privacy officer, and I got asked by the board, I said, Ross, can you tell us if we've been breached? It's a really interesting question, right? Because uh, there are different numbers out there, but the average is about 273 days from the time the breach occurred to you actually discovered it happened. So if a board member is asking you if you've been breached, how the hell do you answer that question? Right? It's very, very hard. So we started implementing something with um, uh, actually an Israeli company called it was a cyber threat intelligence piece because people break in for many different reasons. And most of them follow the standard aberrant behavior models. They're either financially motivated, they're going to sell something you have, they're cause motivated, that they don't like what you do, this or that, therefore they want to embarrass you, right? And then it goes on and on from there. But it sometimes is faster and easier to discover if you've been breached if you look external. Is somebody talking about XYZ Corporation selling something there? Or they're talking about the bad stuff that XYZ Corporation is doing, right? So sometimes it's a lot more effective than we have to do our jobs and lock down internally and everything else at this time. But a lot of times they're just trying to monetize what you have. And if they have to come out somewhere to monetize that. So I think we're going to take some questions from the audience. I think we have, we've seen that there's a definite insider threat issue with external monitoring needed, um, education. So I, I can talk a little bit from, um, I've worked with some of the folks here um, from the Clearforce when I was uh, at another company that we actually found data on the open data dark web. And there was a, I won't name any names, but there was a um, critical infrastructure uh, uh, contractor who happened to lose some very, very important documents and they didn't know how. And those documents made important ships and other things. And so what happened is the workforce they had, and I met some of the workforce, they were very benign to cyber hygiene and all that, but they were highly motivated individuals because they were union workers, but they, you know, they could be easily approached and compromised. And they took pictures of these very special things, and they drifted to other countries. And so we were brought in to look at that. And so we were looking at it from an insider perspective and what data was on the open, deep, and dark web, because the data has to get there somehow. So you can't have enough ways to monitor and to have trust and transparency. And that's, I think, the trust and transparency of all of us. We need to work together. And from my 25 years of being in security and technology, there are so many rock stars in the technology space that I don't know how everybody works together when they get to a CISO, but that has got to change. So that's kind of the mantra I see. With, it's got to happen really quickly with 5G and IoT around the corner. So with that, I would love to have any more comments from the panel or questions from the audience. Oh, you have some questions. Okay, I'll take this out. Get ready. Hi. Um, the gentleman at the end. Oh. Uh, you said something about that there's time uh, to have a discussion about privacy, that this really brings up. Um, so I couldn't agree more. Um, however, with uh, the rise of you know, IoT, a lot of them actually uh, have and collect very, very personal information. 
about us. So you don't necessarily need to know my name or my social security number if you can track my heartbeat, right? To be able to uniquely identify me. So what does that mean about how we define PII? And and where should that definition come from? In other words, is it should it be from in innovation and businesses and so forth, or should it be uh, from you know government regulation? Well, obviously the Europeans are uh, ahead of us on protection of personal information, and, and now California's passed it. Basically, they're on GDPR. Um, I think that it will be. I think the government will end up reflecting well practice rather than government driving innovation and defining privacy. Um, I think um, I think enterprises, um, companies who have a lot of PII like Equifax, who will set their own policies and have more experience and identifying what really can be exploited, what's important to people. They'll have touch points with customers. And eventually, we'll find an emerging idea of what privacy ought to be, rather than a top-down. I think any time, I'm so jaded by government, I have to say, because you know, I have a bad government guy. You know, I'm jaded by government's ability to define what we really want, and uh, so it's more of an up upswell rather than a top-down. That's my two cents. Let me add something there. So, uh, you've asked about GDPR and whatnot. So. In the United States, on a rainy day, a person will walk up to a police station or a stranger with a card table outside of a department store, and for 20% off of a free umbrella, will tell a complete stranger their most intimate information. That's the nature of our culture today. We do that. In an airport, 30,000 miles, you don't have a clue who this person is. There's a piece of paper. You don't know where the piece of paper is going, but everybody does it. Okay? Now take that over to Europe, right? And well, and then we don't want our government to know anything about us, right? Nothing, right? But it's okay for corporate America to do that as part of the American culture because we want the convenience, we want the 20% off, we want the umbrella because it's raining. The go over to Europe, you will never see such an animal. You will never see a complete stranger with a card table set up for 20% off and a free umbrella on a rainy day. However, their government knows everything about them from an identity standpoint because they receive social benefits. That's just Europe in the United States. So from a privacy standpoint, we need a cultural change, right? Because we're so used to receiving the convenience factor, right? The reason my, I'm not where I am today, but the reason my iPhone watch, you know, does my heartbeat, monitors my health records and all that is because I want it to. And I want it to notify me and tell me about things that are going on. I'm looking for the convenience factor of that. So it's gonna, if we're gonna end up with CCPA working across the United States, I just had a meeting with Todd Young, Senator Todd Young yesterday on this, he says on commerce, is we're gonna have to culturally change America on convenience versus privacy. Because you have the right to privacy, but not to anonymity if you want to receive services. And whether that's from a corporate entity or from a government entity, and we're gonna have to figure that balance out and who owns that information. Everywhere from like your cell phone right now, there's a piece of data on your cell phone right now. It's called the ISI. It's the number of actual thing on your phone, right? It's your phone. It's like you own a toaster oven. The serial number on this toaster oven belongs to you. However, <coughs> you don't have any control over this ISI number, and that's the whole way that people are able to take over your phone today because you can't control your own ISI number. Um, so there's going to have to be a lot of cultural change that goes into this. Uh, this privacy deal that's you know, a little more education than just left clicking on a, uh, on a uh, email. Yeah, and I'll just add what you said that from, a, I mean, from our perspective, the tax and obviously the California law has a huge impact, right? Because at the end of the day, when you start removing the ability to leverage that identity to do things like authenticate somebody to be able to get access to a website, um, to actually get access to a credit report so they can get credit, I think what's happened, right, is we've taken Privacy, and we should be looking at privacy very, very seriously. But we got to look at the impact that anything that we, any kind of policy we put in place will have on people's lives as it pertains to how the data that's now hidden, right, and not available for use, how that data may actually, uh, you know, the lack of that data may impact other parts, including cybersecurity. Now, in all honesty, um, I think, you know, 
the, the law actually uh, was written so that as long as it's FCRA data, FCRA data can be can be used, which is good because that means it doesn't prevent the ability for uh, for you know not just ourselves, any other credit uh, company to be able to provide a uh, credit report. But I'll tell you that there's other data sets that we have that we're no longer allowed to use that are core to authenticating individuals and making sure that they can gain access to banking applications and stuff like that using technologies that are out there that you know, people just don't know that the data is behind it. It, it is central and so forth. We're, we're, I mean, we're regulated more than I think uh, many other organizations. Um, and so we take it very seriously, but we also see the impact it can have on the economy if we don't, uh, if we don't do it right. But. So Mayor Dutton, no, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Josh Canary from Cyber Apex Solutions. So Mayor Dutton asked this to be controversial. So um, I'll, I'll ask and see, um, is, is the idea of a carrier-based 5G deployment going to lead us to adopt a zero trust atmosphere across all networks, which that means it's going to be up to the individual to decide how they're connecting to this clearly untrustworthy network. And if that's true, then who do we trust to establish identity? Like, so who, who do we trust to establish, or to allow us to establish our individual identity so we can start managing it as an entity? So we can manage our privacy choices, manage those things. Is that going to be a are we going to tell the government to establish our identity through some function, or is there going to be a private sector solution? So the phone is a different animal, and, this, and I, I hope what you're saying does not happen, because the internet itself, right, because we talk about the www thing, right, it was built for machines, not individuals, right, machine to machine. The phone system as it exists today is meant it's a person-centric thing, right? That's the way it's designed. If I were giving an example, if I were to get on an airplane out of Dulles and get on an airplane and fly to Heathrow, wake up in the morning, and turn my phone on and make a phone call, nobody asks who I am. Nobody asks how it's going to get paid. They're not going to say to me, well, you can make one phone call until we trust you in a week, and then once we trust you a little bit more. No, it just works. It's the whole telco system is based on a system of trust, right? Oh, but with our smartphones, every app I download, I'm saying I'm going to give you access to my contact, but not my mail, my location, but not this, but this, but not that. Right. But the phone itself is tied to an individual, okay? And that ISI, and that it, it's tied to a single device. Now, when you start talking about apps and everything else, we're going to have a whole separate issue. But the, yeah, act, yeah, the, whole, the actual <laughs> telco system, when you pick up the phone and calling you, is an inherent piece of trust, right? Now, there's ways to spoof that and things like that, but we, there's ways to unspoof that. Um, but what I'm hoping is that we don't bring the habits of distrust that are on the internet to the cellular networks that work pretty darn good today, right? On, on, a, system, on a system based upon trust. Do we have time for one more question? Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying, Josh, I think at the end of the day, right, if, if you can control, right, what people are able to see and do in more real time, right, through your device, that's ultimately what we'll have to get to. Like, who actually, I think you asked, who creates that? Um, people like you who are really smart probably will do that. Um, that and, and I say that seriously, right, because I think you have to create that application and then be able to say, okay, I'm now going to offer this application across the board for people to be able to control. Effectively say, can somebody access my credit now, yes or no? Can somebody actually see the, the ID you just talked about? I mean, let's be real. There's software that will tell us tomorrow that every one of us was sitting in this room because we know that our devices are, 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 are being tracked, right, every 15 minutes or whatever because of the fact that, you know, that we've all said, can I track this application? And the answer is yes, sure, why not? Well, that data is being tracked, and, and there's companies that aggregate that data, and they'll see that everybody's sitting here. There's great applications for that information to prevent bad actors from sitting in front of the White House three days you know, a week and figuring out how they're going to do something bad for, for the people there. So I think it's going to be commercially driven, and, and then it's going to be small person that has a you know, groundswell to make sure that privacy is attached. But I hope that that's in line with what you were asking. Yeah, and just, I'm sorry to interject, but to piggyback on Josh's question too, I think that, and especially in the 5G world, our phones, our devices, are going to be the proxy for our identity. 
And if you can make that phone unique in how it shows up anywhere on the internet, that device will go a long way to solving a lot of these cybersecurity problems because the human the human access to that device, uh, what's the first thing that what's the, the, the thing that you know you would have lost first in this life? It's your phone today. If you this even more so than my wallet, if I lose my phone, I've lost my identity. I think that that should be thought of as a proxy for identity. And then there's and, and there are ways in lots of different ways to lock a person to that phone. So um, my name is Jody Reed, I am an attorney, and one of my concerns that I have across the board is the fact that we've got this technology that's moving at the speed of light, 5G is coming. There was, most people you talk to don't have any clue about 5G. And the biggest problem we've got right now, and I'm just curious to what your thoughts are on this, is the fact that from a legal perspective, what we have going on with those records, there's been some criminal stuff because there's been releases and stuff like that, and everyone knows um, Snowden and stuff like that. But really from a legislative perspective, not a lot is happening, I know this for a fact. And so who is making these calls and who's making these determinations, quite frankly, in a lot of ways, is judges. And I'm not going to ding any judge, but I'm going to tell you right now, most of them can't spell 5G. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are that this is coming down the pipe. You know, what is we as an industry, what can we maybe affect this a little bit so that maybe we don't get 51 different laws regarding privacy? regarding cybersecurity protections, what's adequate, what's not adequate. And that's all to be decided right now by a judge, but what can we do as an organization potentially to maybe affect this from a, from a national level? Or at least it's 2022. For a, national, for a national privacy law. I mean, it's realistically 2022. Uh, it's not gonna happen in this Congress. I'm talking about banking and commerce. It's just not going to happen. Um, and, and they're well aware they're going to live with the quilts of Nevada, Indiana, California, different laws, and their job is to facilitate interstate commerce. They recognize that. Uh, I think you're right, it is going to be judges deciding a lot of this uh, for the, at least until 2022. It's not, it's not a good answer, but that's that's what everybody's saying. That's how I deal with the privacy aspect. I'm talking about just generally cybersecurity. Like, so example, X5 has a little bit of a cybersecurity issue. Little one. <laughs> and the judge is basically making that decision as to how liable Equifax is going to be. Did you take the adequate steps to be cyber secure? And that, and, and so you're talking about the price piece. And I agree with you. I think I heard 2022, I heard more 2024, but you're maybe a little more optimistic than I am. So, but, yeah, we're going to have to. Yeah. But it's a whole up. cybersecurity thing, is my concern. Yeah. Well, thank you very much to the panel. I'm sure we can talk more at the networking.